All right, hi, hi everybody. Anybody bought any Bitcoin? When it was cheap? No? Check this out. August 23rd, 2013. I bought a Bitcoin. How much is Bitcoin now? Anybody know? 6,300. Brilliant. Best investment I ever made. Some people call me the Asian Warren Buffett. But uh, my friends know me better, though, because later on that day, I sold half of it. But I kept the rest. Kept the rest. For four days, then I sold that. So basically, just to summarize from this slide, I'm very, very good at investing money. But even somebody as good as me, I could do with a little bit of help every now and again. So I listen to this podcast. Does anybody listen to this podcast, Planet Money? Yeah, a few people in the audience. Great podcast. Um, I should say here that I'm not affiliated with Planet Money or NPR in any way, and they have not endorsed me or my company. But last year, they had a really interesting idea. They noticed that this guy uh, likes to tweet a lot. And sometimes when he tweets about a company, he affects the stock price. So this is President Trump tweeting about, I think it was Toyota Motors, and that that instant, the stock price of Toyota Motors went down. So uh, what they did is they, they thought, what if you could make a trading bot which made trades based off of those tweets? Okay, and that's exactly what they did, and they released it. They released it on Twitter as well as BOTUS, bot of the United States. And you can actually go on Twitter and you can follow BOTUS, um, and every time President Trump tweets and it affects the stock price, they make a stock trade, or actually tweet it. Uh, on there. But unfortunately, they shut it down. You know, they are a podcast and not an investment firm. And uh, everybody was really, really sad about it. <laughs> so I, you know, so that's why I decided to build my own BOTUS. That would make money for me automatically. We know where this is going, right? And so, yes, so far this year, I've made $61. Woo! Now, admittedly, that's about 50 cents for every hour I worked on the project, but I'm calling it a win. But don't get excited, though. I'm not going to be teaching you how to create your very own BOTUS. That, that secret stays with me. This talk is about how to architect and scale a web app like BOTUS, you know? And I chose BOTUS because it's just a little bit more interesting of an application. It's got some meat to it. It's not just like a simple front end. And I'd say not that long ago, even as little as two or three years ago, the question of how to architect and scale an application like this was a lot easier. You know, we were perhaps writing kind of Node Express applications, all server-side rendered. We kind of knew where everything would go. But I think things have changed a lot as everything changes a lot all the time in the web space. I think things have changed a lot in the past few years. We're now all talking about SPAs. And there's a real question that I get from a lot of students and, and audience participants as to, well, what do I do? How do I actually scale an architect and SPA? I know how to build one, but actually, what do I do with it once I've built it? And that's kind of the topic of today's talk. Um, did something animate? OK, yeah, so we would have uh, the haps on our application. We'd have like a view layer, like a template rendering engine. We'd pass in some data. We'd return some HTML, which we would then return back to the end user. We might have something which we'd call a controller, which is between the view layer and the database and does whatever, kind of gets data from the database. But this application is a little bit more interesting in that we've got like a Twitter feed. Did that animate? Yeah, which has a Twitter feed, so something that's actually listening to Twitter, responding to tweets, and it's actually got a really meaty part of the application, which is actually a trading engine itself. And you can imagine when you want to make trades, you've kind of, it's got to be a bit more robust in terms of the coding there. And I'd say like we would used to build this stuff as kind of one atomic GitHub application, one web framework. So we would then typically deploy it on a server. Now, this is actually 
a PaaS offering that we have in Microsoft called App Services, but kind of any kind of server that we would deploy, that's where we would uh, stick it. And yeah, again, the topic of today's talk is how would we do that now, OK? So thank you for the introduction. My name is Asim Hussain. Uh, you can find me on Twitter as Jawak. I blog about Angular and JavaScript on my website, codecraft.tv. And I'm what's called a cloud developer advocate at Microsoft. Bing. I just made the animation to go with the, uh, the image. Um, See, so yeah, I'm a cloud developer advocate at Microsoft. We're a fairly new team inside Microsoft. We're kind of the open source advocates. There's, a, there's only not many of us, only about 60 of us, but they're all, we're all pretty cool people. And if you want to find out who we are and more about us, you can, you can click that link there. Um, oh, and I'm, a, I'm, in the, I'm a cloud developer advocate, so I'm kind of I'm a conduit between developers and the Azure team. So I don't just sit here and talk to you about Azure or cloud. My, my goal is to get feedback from you and feed it back to the Azure team. So if you've got any feedback on Azure or cloud or anything like that, come and speak to me afterwards, or you can DM me on Twitter. My tweets are open. I'm also an instructor on Udemy. Any Udemy? People know Udemy here? One or two? OK. They've recently added, it, added in automatic transcriptions to the courses. And they added in, um, is that working? No, it's not working. So yeah, they, they correctly transcribed my name to awesome. So uh, this talk is going, uh, my name is awesome. And uh, this talk is going to be very asim. All right. So um, one second, sorry. Here we go. So as I said, like, how do we build this kind of application today? Um, before, we, we probably would have hosted it on like a, something like a virtual machine or a PaaS. Do people know what a PaaS is? Like a few hands in the audience. OK, fine. I'm going to explain everything from scratch, right? Because this is kind of more a cloud deployment talk. Back in the day, we used to have on-premise, which is basically you'd buy your hardware. I'm old enough to remember when we used to have to buy our own hardware for our firms. And basically, what that meant was you, oh, good, excellent. You, um, you had to buy your own hardware. So if the hard drive failed, it was your responsibility to go fix it, right? People didn't want that. So then we kind of invented infrastructure as a service, right? So somebody else has the hardware in a data center, and you're just renting it with virtual virtualization technology, right? Someone else is responsible for the hardware. If the hard drive fails, it's on them. But you're still responsible for the operating system and the web framework itself. So we went a step further, and we got PaaS's, platforms as a service, where somebody else is responsible for the hardware, somebody else is responsible for the operating system, and you're just responsible for installing whatever web framework you want to use. That's called a PaaS, a platform as a service. There's loads of them out there. Uh, Azure App Frameworks is App Services is one of them. We've got Google App Engine, Amazon Beanstalk, and I think the most famous one is Heroku. Um, so these are all PaaSes, OK? So that's what I used to host all of my web applications on, was PaaSes. And that's why I would host this type of application. Right? What would we do these days? So we wouldn't use Express. I would basically build this whole thing as an SPA. So I would t essentially take the view layer plus a bit more of the functionality. I'd rip it out. And basically, I'd turn it into a spa. OK? But what is a spa? Well, I'm just going to explain it. It's, a single, it's, a, it's an application where only a single page is ever returned from the server. OK, stay with me. I know we're all JavaScript developers here. We've probably built 1,000 spars. But stay with me, right? So what does it look like? Well, I have, this is the output of an, the Angular build process. For you to build an, an, a spar with Angular, and you did ng build, this is the output folder. Then whether you have one URL in your application or 10,000 URLs in your application, that's it. That's all you see. Nothing else, OK? Just a folder with some files in it. And the important thing is, is that it has one index.html file. When that file downloads, it then loads all the JavaScripts and the other CSSs, JavaScript bootstraps, then it takes over uh, navigating your page, right? So that's it. You basically take 
the view layer, you turn it into a spa. But where do you host it? Where do you put it? Right? And this is the core thing that I hear, that, that I see a lot of people do, the, the decision a lot of people make, is they essentially host it on a PaaS. Right? Maybe they drop a node server in front of it, they, they serve as a static asset, but that's the, that's, the, that's the decision I see a lot of people make. And I, it often confuses me because, like, why are you doing this? And I think one of the reasons is that you're kind of just so used to using that platform before that you just kind of start keep on using it when you use de deploying a spa, right? But what I'm going to show you is there's a better way that's much faster and much cheaper, right? But to understand this, we have to discuss static versus dynamic. Now, I know a lot of you are again going to say, I kind of know this topic already, but you'll be surprised. Um, I'm always surprised that I have different ways of explaining this than others. OK, so static, a static request. A static request is one where if you request the same URL, However you request it, it's going to return the same data. So if you request the same URL over different times, it will return the same data. If two different users on two different machines request the same URL and it returns the same data, that's a static request. A dynamic request is the opposite. So perhaps two different users request the same URL, it returns different data. That's a dynamic request. You with me? OK, so it's quiz time. There are no prizes. So quiz number one, is requesting a JPEG file, is that a static request or a dynamic request? Ah, there's always, there's always one guy that says it depends. OK, who thinks it's dynamic? One guy, sorry. Who thinks it's static? <laughs> there you go. It's static, I'm afraid. I'm afraid you're wrong. Um, but yeah, it's that, it's, it depends, right? It depends if you made a, a URL that, is, uh, that returns whatever you want. But yeah, typically, it's a static request, all right? What about the home page, the HTML for the home page for your application? Hmm. Is that static or dynamic? Who thinks static? 10%. Who thinks dynamic? 10%. OK, interesting. Well, yeah, it depends. Right? It depends how you code it up. I used to code up my uh, home pages in a dynamic way. If you were logged in, it would return different HTML versus if you weren't logged in. OK, massive problems with that. I stopped doing that a long, long, long time ago. But yeah, it depends, right? And I'm going to show you that if you actually do it statically, there's a huge amount of advantages that you can take from that. How about like if you had like a profile page in your application? Like it's different depending on different users, static or dynamic. Static? One guy static. Dynamic? OK, good. Most of you won this quiz. Those two guys, I think you have to, I think you have to leave or, or something. <laughs> so then, let me ask you the next question. Is an SPA dynamic or static? Who thinks dynamic? Who thinks static? It's static, right? All I, sh I showed you before was an output folder. When you're serving a SPA, you're just serving the contents of a folder. The folder, the contents of the folder won't change no matter what. No matter which users are requesting the SPA, no matter over time, it won't change. It will change if you recompile your SPA and you change the contents of that folder, true. But once it's up, it's static, right? Why is that important? It's important for a whole bunch of reasons. One of them, in terms of performance, is caching. Okay? Caching is like so insanely important for performance. I think it's the number one thing you need in order to get performance, especially on the web. There's loads of caching solutions out there, the most common of which is browser-based caching. I think we all know a lot about browser-based caching. But actually, when it comes to requesting data on the internet, there's quite a few nodes that your request has to go through. Okay? And each of them can have a caching layer. So we've got like obviously our server, 
we've got a CDN, which you probably already know about, right? If you're using a CDN, it means you're probably paying for one. You're, you're aware of its advantages. You're aware of the performance improvements it's getting you, but you're paying for it. I think the really interesting one is proxies. So we don't really have proxy caches much anymore in, in kind of countries which have good internet uh, infrastructure, but definitely in countries which have poorer internet infrastructures, there's a lot of proxy caches knocking around. So perhaps your ISP or the person that you're paying your internet for, they will have their own proxy cache which sits in their servers on their data center because they don't want to pay the upstream costs if they don't have to, right? So with proxy caching, one of the coolest things about it is that like, you, if you get into a proxy cache, you can make a request from your browser for a page. And it, from the browser tab, it will look like a full request going out. And it's going to be hit by the proxy, and the proxy would return it. Right? So that's not hitting your infrastructure. It's not hitting your CDN. You're not paying to serve this request. You're saving money. I told you it's good with money. Yeah. How do you take advantage of this? Well, there's a bunch of different ways. I'm not going to go into any depth of this. I think probably most of us know about some sort of headers. We can use a variety of different headers. The cache control is the most important one, and the public is the most important one. Because your content is static, you can use public. And public means that when you return content with that header, it's telling the, 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 the different nodes in that um, connection that they can store the content. So it can be stored publicly. It can be stored publicly because that same request is going to return the same data for everybody. Right? That's the advantage of static uh, caching. So yeah, and these are just different um, headers for different um, parts of the, uh, to say how long you want to store it for. With HTML, I think a really great idea is to store, uh, if you want to cache the HTML, just to store it for five minutes. Because there's nothing worse than kind of having a piece of HTML that is going to get cached for like 10 years, because then a the person will never be able to, to update their website. So just cache it for five minutes, and that's good to give you know, a little bit of um, handle a little bit of load. OK, the other reason you want to have static content is because of serving. OK? When you, when you want to use a dynamic request, you use a dynamic web server. Node, for instance, is, the, I think, the best dynamic web, web server. You can drop a bit of JavaScript to return you different data depending on the request that you're making. But when serving static assets, you should use a service that is optimized for static assets. Okay. Oh, I should say, I, I work in Microsoft. I think I mentioned that. So I'm going to discuss Azure. Um, but a lot of this stuff I'm talking about has equivalent platforms across the different uh, uh, companies out there. And I will mention the other ones as well. So on Azure, the service is Azure Storage. If you're on Amazon, the most famous one is, is S3. Okay. So this is a service that is just optimized for returning static assets. The code that drives this is just super simple. It's just reading a file from disk and streaming it back out. There's so many optimizations you can make on lower level APIs just to do that kind of reading a file and streaming it out as you're reading it. So there's lo using a static web server is extremely uh, performant for serving static assets. It's uh, also fast, super fast, and it's also much, much cheaper than serving something from something like an app service, which for the PMs who work in my app service team probably hate me saying that. But it's true. Right? I've got a little video here. Uh, this is a super, super simple test using Apache Bench with requesting the same uh, 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 content served once from an app service, which is a PaaS, and the other one from storage, which is like an S3 equivalent. So I'm just going to do a quick request. It's doing like 10,000 requests. Mm -hmm. Awkward. Awkwardly slow. I'm going to wait. Keep it going. So there you go, right? Now, admittedly, I didn't optimize or tweak the app service stuff in the, uh, at all. But the point I'm also making is that I didn't have to tweak or optimize anything when serving through storage, right? Think about it. Storage is the, the servers underneath that. There's people are auto scaling the stuff for you, right? But you don't have to deal with anything to do with that. It's much faster, also much cheaper. 
So that's what I would do is I'd basically take your SPA and what you want to do is you want to host it on some sort of storage solution, be that Azure Storage or S3 or, or something along those lines because it's a static content and it should be served through something that's optimized to serve back static content. But what about the rest of our stuff? Right? This is what most of the talks just end here. Right? What about the rest of the, of the application? Where do you put that? Right? Um, and to discuss that, we need to talk about one quick topic called serverless. Does anybody know serverless? Used serverless? About 20%. Perfect. All right, so I'm going to give you my explanation of serverless very, very quickly. So on the x-axis is time. On the y-axis is, is load. And this kind of graph is just some sort of application that you built and kind of load over time. Back in the day, and I still remember getting like emails from senior management saying, Go and predict what the load will be for the next year. We need to buy the servers to install in the data center to you know, handle the load for the next year. Crazy requests. It was never going to be accurate. But that's what we had to do. And we basically do something like this. And we then basically hopefully buy enough servers to handle the peak load that we're getting, right? But that's pretty annoying because you're paying for a bunch of servers you don't really need. So then when VMs came along, we started kind of implementing stuff like this, where we'd basically onboard a server and have some scaling logic, which kind of added servers and took them away when it needed to. But the problem here is, is that I'm now paying for, again, I'm paying for servers that I didn't really need, and I scaled down too fast, so now my performance is really bad on my website. And again, the act of predicting your load is it's a really complex problem to solve, right? It's a really complex problem to solve because you don't know in the next second whether you're going to get 10,000 requests or zero, right? There's, there's nothing to kind of predict uh, in any kind of significant, uh, uh, it's hard to predict. So what you want ideally is something like this, right? Someone else does the scaling for you and you only pay for whatever you use. That's it. And that's all that serverless is. Serverless is just kind of a way of charging you for something and with auto scaling, right? And I love, I love this explanation. You, the serverless, you pay only for actual usage and not for predicted usage, and it's auto scaling, right? That's serverless definition. Another quiz Is storage or S3, is it serverless? What do you think? Yes? How many people think storage and S3 is serverless? Five. How many thinks it's not? About the same. It's serverless. Believe me, it is. Think about it. Um, if it if it quacks like a duck, if it walks like a duck, if it uh, t tastes like a duck, <laughs> it's a it's a duck, right? So storage, it does. It's auto scaling for you. The servers underneath that they are scaling out. You just don't know it. It's all happening for you, and you only pay for your bandwidth and your storage costs, it's serverless, right? So if storage is serverless, and we love serverless because it's cheaper, it scales down when you're not in use, it's faster, it scales up when you need it to, and it's kind of no effort to maintain, right? Can we make the rest of our application serverless? This is why I'd say SPAs and serverless are this kind of perfect conjoining of technologies that work beautifully together. So that's the question I'm going to ask here is like, can we take kind of the next layer in our application, the API, and can we turn that serverless as well, right? And the solution here is another kind of technology offering in serverless called FAS, Functions as a Service, okay? So just to explain this, let's go back into the slide I had before, and we finished off on PASs, but that wasn't the end of the story. What happened then is a lot of people realize, well, all I'm doing with this web framework is calling a URL that's executing a block of code, in my view. That's all I'm doing constantly. So let's just abstract this out. Let's just say that I want you to handle that for me. So you deal with the web framework, and I just want to host a function somewhere and execute that code for it whenever a URL is hit. That's all I want to deal with. We're abstracting out the framework as well bunch of different technologies for this and platforms. and Azure, it's Azure Functions. On Amazon, it's Lambda. There's IBM OpenWhisk. There's, there's a bunch of them, right? Um, and it's serverless because you, you don't get charged. You, you get charged by gigabyte seconds plus executions. Um, so if you, if you make zero executions, you get charged zero. And underneath, it auto scales automatically for you. 
But it has limitations. It's limited to five minutes runtime, so after five minutes, it just shuts off. And it's stateless. It's, it's kind of stateless. It's like has like a temp folder type situation, but you can't really rely on it, right? Every invocation is, is you have to assume it's stateless. There's a bunch of different ways of creating it. I've just recently gotten into code, VS Code, and VS Code uses here. A few, excellent. Um, so I use the, the VS Code extension. You just kind of few clicks, and it creates the, the function trigger, and you can just drop a breakpoint in, hit F5, and then you, you, you're, you're, you're already debugging away. And you can just hit another button and deploy it upwards. So it's really, really easy to develop with this kind of serverless technology. You have kind of local development tools as well, and you can also deploy online. So today, I wouldn't use kind of an app service to, to host this stuff. I would use serverless functions to host my API part. Right? That's what I'd basically use to build this application today, again, because SPAs and serverless, perfect combination together. But what about the rest of the stuff, the Twitter feed and the engine? Now, you might think that the best thing to do is then, again, turn that into an Azure function or a serverless function. But remember, I told you that serverless functions have these limitations, right? So it has a five-minute runtime. It's stateless. My trading engine, I don't want to switch off in the middle of a trade, right? So you need something out there that kind of manages your functions, this kind of concept coming along. And it's called orchestration, right? This is kind of a concept that's coming along in kind of serverless programming. So you need something that orchestrates all of your serverless functions, right? So it needs to be something that's long running. It needs to be stateful, OK? So what, what orchestrates your functions for the What orchestrates your API functions? It's your browser. Your browser is orchestrating your API function. Your browser is the one that's deciding, oh, I'm going to retry this API request because it failed. Your browser has the statefulness, right? So if you switch off your browser, it will lose its state. So we need something similar for the Twitter feed. Um, Twitter feed and engine. And then the mistake I see a lot of people make these days is they then, because then, they just need something long running, they keep part of their infrastructure running on an app service, on a PaaS or something like that, because it just needs something long running, right? But there's something that's interesting that's coming out. Um, on Azure, we call it drawable functions. There's not really much similar. The closest thing to this in Amazon is called step functions. But the, the drawable functions, are, they're both kind of solving the same problem, but drawable functions solve them a little bit differently. We just, uh, it's just gone into general availability for C Sharp, but we've just gone into preview for JavaScript. Super exciting. And what it does is it has a beautiful syntax for writing these serverless functions. So this would be like a serverless function you create. And one of the things you might notice here is this a generator. OK? It's a generator function. So generator function, you have like a yield request here. So typically with generator functions, when you execute it and you reach the yield, the function will return. And you can do other things and enter back into the function right at that point. But it stays in memory, right? What this durable functions does is built using something called a durable framework where you can actually take the state of your function while it's running, store it to disk, and exit memory. So actually, this second yield, this can return in two days. And this function will just reappear in memory and continue executing from where it left off. It's, it's pretty cool, amazing technology. But what it means is you can now have a function which lasts longer than, uh, than five minutes. So it's a way of orchestrating a lot of your functionality. And that is how I would build a, a lot of this functionality now, is again, SPA, and then everything else is built on, 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 on kind of some sort of serverless technology. And I'll use durable functions for the orchestration. So I have zero seconds. Summary. SPAs are static. We can therefore use caching and serve using Azure storage. And by the way, storage is serverless. Did it? Yes. So might as well make the rest of your application serverless, because we love serverless. Um, so use a FAS, a function of service, uh, for your API. And then we orchestrate with drawable functions, uh, or perhaps logic apps we didn't have time to go into. Thank you very much for your time. <laughs>